The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ to our last Holden Evening Prayer Service, as this Sunday will begin Holy Week with Palm Sunday. I have a bunch of thank yous. I want to thank Jennifer Lundberg for preaching tonight. I want to thank Lon and Diane Wright for playing for this service, and Signe Hartman and on the violin, and Jane Hartman on the piano for our prelude music. Thank you so much, and Elizabeth Maxwell for leading us in the whole evening prayer service. And tonight we have communion, and we're blessed to celebrate the Lord's Supper. At that point in the service, we will invite you to come down the center aisle and pick up a cup from the trays by the baptismal font. Then you can come forward and receive the bread or the wafer and the wine or the grape juice. Gluten-free wafers and grape juice are always available. Simply let us know. And even if you're taking grape juice, please take a cup because we pour it now with a pitcher. It does not matter who you are, where you've been, or where you're going. You're worshiping with us now. So you're invited to join us in the Feast of the Lord. And we have a couple of temple talks tonight. Um, I think Sydney wants to go first, so I'll let you go first, Sydney. The senior high youth who will be going to Leech Lake Reservation for our mission trip will be serving our Palm Sunday brunch Sunday, April 2nd, between services from 9.15 a.m. to 11 a.m. to help celebrate the end of the silent auction. Join us for cinnamon rolls and fresh fruit in the fellowship hall. Meal is a free will offering. Don't forget our silent auction ends at noon on April 2nd. Thank you for always supporting our ministry and faith journeys. And Rick, I'd invite you to come up as council president. Good evening. I'm Rick Purrington, the First Lutheran Church Council president. And I'm here this evening to share a little bit of information about the call process. As we know, Pastor Scott will be retiring at the end of May. We congratulate Pastor Scott and wish him and Carolyn the best, of course. Uh, our church will be forever grateful for Pastor Scott's leadership these past 10 years. And to show our appreciation, we will be having a celebration brunch uh, for Pastor Scott on Sunday, June 4th. So stay tuned for more information about that. Uh, this news, of course, also has brought a lot of questions about the process for calling a new pastor. Our First Lutheran Church Executive Committee has been in communication with the ELCA Synod about this, of course. And I'll share a little bit about what we know here at this point. First, the Synod's call process is purposefully deliberate. The securing of a new full-time pastor here at First Lutheran will take uh, a number of months. So this means that we're working with the Synod to hopefully secure an interim pastor starting this summer. There is a shortage of interim pastors, though, so uh, this isn't guaranteed. If we have an interim pastor or not, as this call process plays out, our church may be calling upon more lay ministry, like Jennifer this evening. As many of us know, over the last few years, we've been blessed with many members who have been willing to uh, take on some lay ministry roles, and they've done just a great job. So if you've ever thought about getting more involved in our church, uh, maybe now's the time. Ultimately, the process of calling a new pastor is an exciting time for our church to reflect and refresh, renew. And we thank you for prayerfully considering what your role is going to be over this uh, next few months, this time of change and exciting potential for First Lutheran Church. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. And I'll begin the Holden Evening Prayer. Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world. No light, no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening. And the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness.
May our prayers come before you, O oh God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us, so that in union with all creation, we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Tonight's reading comes from 1 Kings, chapter 17, verses 7 through 24. But after a while, the wadi dried up, because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Go now to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and live there, for I have commanded a window there to feed you. So he set out and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the town, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel, so that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of meal in a jar, and a little oil in a jug. I am now gathering a couple of sticks, so that I may go home and prepare for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Do not be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake of it and bring it to me, and afterwards make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord of the God of Israel, the jar of the meal will not be emptied and the jug of oil will not fail until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. She went and did as Elijah said, so that she, as the Lord, she as well, and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of the meal was not empty, neither did the jug of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. After the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She said, then said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death, death of my son. But he said to her, Give me your son. He took him from her bosom, carried him up to the upper chamber where he was lodging, and laid him on his own bed. He cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought the calamity even upon the widow with whom I am staying by killing her son? And he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried out to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber of, into the house, and gave him to his mother. Then Elijah said, See, your son is alive. So the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth is truth. The word of the Lord. Good evening. So as you just read, or as you just heard being read, would you bring me a little water in a jar so I may have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called, and bring me please a piece of bread. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied, I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. It sounds like she had accepted her son's fate, her and her son's fate. No hope for the future. This was it for them. They were going to die together of starvation. But as she lost hope, here comes Elijah telling her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me, and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. Would you have done it? If she had no hope for the future, what more did she have to lose, other than trusting what Elijah said? She trusted Elijah, and it paid off. 
never-ending flour and oil. Sounds kind of like an evening at Olive Garden. <laughs> but even then, after this miracle of never-ending flour and oil, she still had wavering faith at the first sign of trouble again. Her son grew ill and eventually stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, what do you have against me, man of God? Did you come to remind me of my, son, my sin and kill my son? She believed she was being punished by God. Her trust and faith in God was fading with the death of her son. I hear anger in her statement to Elijah, and these things are still today things that parents go through when they're facing terminal illnesses with their children. Anger is a stage in the grieving process. So my daughter, Aubrey, um, does competitive dancing, and her dance solo this year um, is to a song called In Jesus' Name, which you'll all see and hear in a little bit. Um, it's by Katie Nicole, and it's one of my favorites. And the lyrics start as, I speak the name of Jesus over you. In your hurting, in your sorrow, I will ask my God to move. I speak the name because it's all that I can do. In desperation, I'll seek heaven and pray this for you. I pray for your healing, that circumstances would change. I pray that the fear inside would flee in Jesus' name. I pray that a breakthrough would happen today. I pray miracles over your life in Jesus' name. Early on in the competition season, she came to me and asked me what kind of emotion she should be portraying on the stage. Is it happy or sad, Mom? How do you explain to a 10-year-old that this song is so much more emotionally complex than just happy or sad? It's a feeling that is indescribable. I asked her to let me sing it for her and watch the emotion on my face, but she rolled her eyes and walked away. So, <laughs> um, so maybe some of you have seen the movie Miracles from Heaven. So this was my alternative to singing it. So this was based on a true story of the Beam family from Burlington, Texas when 10-year-old Anna is diagnosed with an incurable digestive disorder that threatens her life. The entire family's faith is tested. At church, Anna's mom is approached by two women that offer their condolences to her, but they suggest that Anna hasn't gotten better due to either her or her family's sins. Anna's mom begins to lose her faith in God and everything else in general. Anna's Anna and her sisters are outside playing when Abby and Anna climb a tall tree. The branch they're sitting on cracks. Abby tells Anna to walk to the end of the branch. It cracks again, and Anna falls 30 feet down a hole in the tree. Over the next few hours, paramedics and the press show up on scene. This moment in the movie is so impactful. Anna's mom starts looking around at the reporters and the emergency personnel. The sound goes muffled. Things are in slow motion, and she feels the gravity of the situation crashing down on her. She starts to cry out to God, walks to the base of the tree. She kneels down and places her hand on the tree, pleadingly praying the Lord's Prayer. Her friends and her family join her kneeling at the tree with their hands on each other. The medical personnel are also praying. I look over at Aubrey at this point in the movie, tears streaming down both of our faces, and I sing, I speak the name of Jesus over you. This, this is the emotion that you portray in your dance, this indescribable feeling of sorrow and pain. The medics end up pulling Anna out of the tree, and after suffering a mild concussion, medical tests confirm, miraculously, Anna's disorder is gone. 
Um, Anna tells her parents that when she hit her head after the fall, everything went black and she felt an out-of-body out experience. She saw a butterfly and touched it, which appeared to bring her to heaven. We see Anna walking through colorful woods before approaching the gates of heaven. She says she spoke to God, and while she wanted to stay, he told her she must return and that she would be healed. In one of the final scenes of the movie, Anna's mom stands up in front of church and gives this speech. I felt hopeless. I felt alone. I was angry that our prayers weren't being answered. I lost my faith. Because of that, I didn't see what was all around me. Albert Einstein said, there are only two ways to live your life. One as as though nothing is a miracle, and the other is as though everything is a miracle. Still Anna's mom quoting, I'm the first to tell you, I wasn't living my life as though everything is a miracle. I missed a lot. Miracles are everywhere. Miracles are goodness, sometimes showing up in the strangest of ways through people who are just passing through our lives. Miracles are love, miracles are God, and God is forgiveness. Why was Anna healed when today around the world there are so many children suffering? I don't know the answer, but after everything I've been through, I've realized I'm not alone. And whatever you may be going through, I'm here to tell you, you are not alone. Miracles are God's way of letting us know he's here. So it's easy for us to see ourselves in this story as maybe the person receiving the miracle, but don't forget that you can be the people who are just passing through others' lives as miracles. This movie was based on a true story, and it sounds so familiar, or similar to Elijah and the widow. After the widow's son took his last breath, she questioned him and God. Elijah took him from her arms and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, have you brought tragedy even on this widow I am staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried out to the Lord, Lord my God, let this boy's life return to him. The Lord heard Elijah's cry, and the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Then the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is true. So in these stories, we hear first hopelessness, loss of faith, defeat, then we hear anguish, despair, desperation, and finally, revival, restoration of faith, and healing. I leave you today with, again, the quote from Albert Einstein. There are only two ways to live your life. One as though nothing is a miracle, and the other as though everything is a miracle. Amen. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying to them, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, you proclaim our Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom. Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see that the Lord is good.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. The light shines in the darkness. Joy song. 
Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless our God. May God create. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.